I'm happy to introduce Laurie Penny. Um, Laurie is a journalist, writer, and activist from London. And you will talk about, uh, your talk is called Networked Consent, mm -hmm. and it will be about how changes in communication technology allow us to think differently about consent and desire and the nature of power. Looking Thank forward you. to that. Hello. Thanks. <laughs> okay, is this working? This is fine. All right, so um, I wanted to start by saying it's a really great honor to be here. Um, I loved uh, all, I loved Republica last year and speaking here, and it's been a great conference so far. And to apologize because um, the origin of this talk uh, came about because uh, Yetz, who's sitting in the front row, uh, sent me an email saying, oh, you haven't applied for Republica yet, and I happen to be in Berlin with some digital theory people drunk at the time and uh, ha in the middle of an intense conversation about power and desire and the end of the world and the heat death of the universe and what we were going to do about it and I ended up just going and I found that I'd submitted a talk and it had been accepted and so I've based this talk on that. Um, so I hope it will be interesting. It's a little bit, um, a tiny bit what I would call theory wank with the greatest possible respect, but I believe very much in um, trying to explain things in words that, um, well, everybody can understand. I'm, I'm, I'm not such a, I, I'm, I'm keen on theory in, in, in a demotic sense. So this is, um, this is uh, a talk which attempt, attempts to blend those two things. So, um, I am going to talk about what consent means, what a network does, and how the notion of a network changes our ideas about power and desire, and what it means to have an idea about freedom. And um, this, I wrote about what I'm interested in right now. And, and this is basically feminism, journalism, social justice, digital rights, uh, digging about on Twitter, which is actually quite important to this talk, because Twitter is, oh, Twitter is the back channel uh, upon which we're currently working out all of our cultural neuroses about what it means to have a public forum. Um, and uh, this is a talk which is going to involve talking about rape culture, talking about women's rights, and talking about democracy and the public space um, as if those things existed in the same world, and if um, you are upset with that in any way, the exit is behind you. It's there. Um, yeah, so um, I'm assuming that you guys are all comfortable because none of you are leaving. Right, so 101 years ago uh, this year, Emily Wilding Davidson threw herself in front of the King's Horse at the Epsom Derby as uh, an act of protest. Uh, against the uh, failure of the British government to grant the right to vote to women. Emily Wilding Davidson is actually a very interesting character. She's famous for being the first British suffragette martyr, but that's not all she did. She was, um, I mean, she's, she's wearing this really rather far out outfit here, and the, the suffragettes are sort of, um, they're spoken of as sort of, these figures are fun, really, are sort of running around in their slightly bantamish outfits, being, you know, knitting and asking for the vote, and then they got the vote, and that was fantastic. And it's all sort of, it's discussed today as this sort of jam sale, WI, fluffy um, instance in the history of um, how democracy was won. But actually, um, in 1914, this is what a terrorist looked like. Um, <laughs> Yeah, this is it, this is her. Um, they were considered dangerous extremists. They were locked up and tortured. Um, what happened to Emily Davidson uh, about a year before she threw herself under that horse was um, that she, um, there was a census went on in 1911 uh, the whole, um, for the whole of Britain. And um, she, was, she was littler than I am, actually. She was a very, very tiny lady indeed, although I am, of course, normal sized. And, um, she snuck into the House of Commons and hid in a cupboard um, in the crypt in the House of Commons so that when the census came round the next day, she could legitimately put House of Commons, Westminster, as her address. 
and um, therefore, you know, just troll the entire system. And uh, for this and other acts of protest, she was uh, imprisoned several times, the la on the last time of which, um, what they did to her is they put her in a small waterproof cell, uh, stripped naked, and they put a hose in through the window and slowly filled the cell up with cold water until she almost drowned. And um, this happened, this was a, one of the means uh, they used to um, beat the suffragettes into submission because they really were seen as um, dangerous threats to the state, although obviously now the idea of you know, the heroic suffragette has been incorporated and dis into uh, our national myth and kind of disnified and it's spoken of as you know, just something nice that happened and then they got the vote and it was lovely, but actually it wasn't like that. And... Um, the reason I mention Emily Davison, I, I made a study of her life last year. Uh, the reason I mention Emily Davison is um, that as a feminist writer and a journalist and an activist and as somebody who's interested in what democracy means, I often find people saying to me, well, since you're a woman, obviously you ought to vote and you ought to su support everyone voting because isn't that what women want? And actually, I was thinking about this. And I think that actually Emily Davison would be disgusted at that argument and would be um, really shocked that the idea of, um, oh, of women's suffrage has been co-opted into um, an argument for complicity with the current system of, um, of, democratic, uh, of democratic representation, which, um, as we know, particularly in Europe right now, isn't exactly doing what it says on the tin. Um, what, does it, what does consent mean? I absolutely love this quote because um, in the next half hour I'm going to talk about sexual consent and the consent of the governed and the consent of the governed as if um, because I think those two things inform each other. The consent of the governed is um, a term that first crops up in the US Constitution and in, in the Declaration of Independence, um, but has become a term uh, that's used uh, to, uh, to describe how governments gain their legitimacy, how, um, uh, how they get the right to do the things that they do to us and what it means to, um, to consent to, uh, to, to be a subject of a state. And I think that, the, um, that the, what's happening to our understanding of sexual consent and what's happening to our understanding of democratic consent can, can, can inform each other. They're not the same thing. And um, no, I'm not using one as a metaphor for the other here. I, I, um, because I work as, uh, in, uh, in women's rights and I work in um, sort of what other people call real politics, um, I... Uh, these are my two areas of interest, and the more I think about them, the more I think that our idea of what, what power is legitimately um, is changing very fast in, um, in lots and lots of ways. And now, um, yeah. Um, so, <laughs> a brief primer on, uh, on the use of the term democracy in the past um, let's say, thousand years. And the story that we're told, I mean, certainly the story I was told growing up in the UK and the story I learned from uh, being a latchkey kid in the early 90s and watching a lot of American cartoons. Um, I actually learned first about uh, the American Constitution and uh, the American Civil War by watching The Chipmunks. And um, which, which it seems that actually quite a lot of my American friends did too, because that's the level on, you know, which you know, the American school system seems to work. That was fine. But yeah, the idea that we're told uh, in, in the West is that um, democracy began somewhere a few thousand years ago in ancient Greece, sort of rolled around Europe for a few hundred years and then um, went via Britain where it got a bit better and then eventually found its natural forever BFF homeland in America. Um, and actually that's not what democracy is at all. It's not a straight line and a trajectory like that. And um, uh, we, over the last, even over the last 300 years, the idea of democracy um, the word democracy has been used to mean many, many different things. Um, around the time, uh, the word democracy appears nowhere in the, um, in the Declaration of Independence, um, for example, because actually at the time, again, uh, saying you were a Democrat was 
pretty much akin to saying you were a terrorist. It was a very, very dangerous thing to be. People did not like the idea of democracy. They, um, they thought it would lead to mob rule. And um, the idea that um, everybody voting for representatives, um, and especially everybody in the, the entire nation or an entire state voting for representatives was the ideal, perfect way of governing a country, ne never mind something that could be exported, um, is really only a very recent thing. Um, so, and uh, if we're talking about the history of suffrage, we have to remember that until uh, the almost the mid 20th, the early mid 20th century, certainly in the UK, various parts of the US, it wasn't just um, women and people of colour who were denied the vote in many circumstances, it was also people without property, um, as well as young people and, and people under 18 who are still denied the vote in many, many countries, as are prisoners. Um, we must not think about democracy as something that has always been there, always been the same, always involved every single person with a right to a say about what the government does um, voting and uh, having the right to have their say um, at the ballot box. It's, uh, it's a little more complicated than that. And then we get to the idea that democracy, um, for, certainly for the people at the top of the political spectrum, has come to mean this thing that can be exported to other countries. Democracy is um, not only, uh, not only uh, the right and proper only way of government, but it's something that you can actually impose on other people. Um, and so uh, the, uh, the writer and critic John Berger has um, a, I, I'm afraid actually my internet broke down halfway through making this presentation, which is why I was running around like a blue ass fly about 10 minutes ago. So I wanted to get this quote for you, but you'll have to accept the garb garbled version. Um, so John Berger in the book A to X says uh, that democracy uh, is one of those words like freedom and love that have over the course of uh, the past few decades been taken and twisted and tortured until they give up to their polar opposite. Because actually, um, a lot of people use the word democracy right now to mean the exact opposite, to mean complicity, to mean you cannot argue with what the state is doing, to mean that you must accept what is done to you. And um, this is what neoliberalism does. This is what neoliberalism does um, in terms, in all aspects of human life. Um, it makes you, um, it controls human beings by persuading us that we are already free, that this is the freest we can possibly be. And any idea of, any, any sort of question to that is, uh, is crazy, is deranged, is the product of um, a, 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 actually there are, um, it, it is now a medical condition. Dissent is now a medical condition. It's called the object, um, Oppositional Defiant Disorder. Yes, that's the name in the, uh, in the recent DSM-5 uh, manual of um, uh, mental illnesses, objective defiant disorder, and uh, you can be given drugs for it, and then it goes away. Um, so, uh, apologies if anybody finds this image disturbing. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what sexual violence is and what state violence is. Does anybody recognize this picture? Anybody? No, well, this is Cecily McMillan. Um, I didn't take this picture, somebody called Z.D. Roberts did, but I was actually standing about where that woman in the yellow... I would never wear a yellow trench coat, so that's not me. But um, I, I was about there when this went on. And uh, this is Cecily McMillan, an activist uh, at Occupy Wall Street. This is the 17th of March, 2012. And um, Cecily McMillan is an, a socialist activist in New York and was part of a demonstration on that day and uh, was assaulted by police officers. Uh, Cecily's epileptic. What you see there is her having a fit and being brought off the bus on which she was taken, being taken to jail. Um, and everybody who was there saw Cecily being put in handcuffs cuffs and left on the ground, flopping around, um, clearly in some physical distress. And we were shouting, you know, you've got to take that girl to hospital. And uh, this week, uh, Cecily McMillan was convicted of felony assault on a police officer um, for that, on that day. It, apparently, that is a picture of Cecily McMillan assaulting a police officer. You can clearly see that that is what's happening there. And um, she faces seven years in jail um, whilst... Uh, uh, the, and this is uh, the, uh, the framing of 
uh, police violence against protesters as actually an assault on those police is something that's happened in the UK. It happened with Alfie Meadows. Um, it's happened with... with uh, and it's happened with Cecily McMillan here. It's a tactic to destroy the reputations of people who stand up and dissent against, uh, against what's going on. And uh, Occupy was very important to me. Um, and it was uh, very important, I think, to a lot of people here. Um, although it's several years ago now, and I think we can really talk, I, I think we're now at a place where we can talk about what Occupy meant um, from a position of distance and, uh, the, uh, and the, the mourning for that period of time being slightly over. And um, to me, Occupy was a massive voicing of dissent and disgust with the system of representative democracy and the system of capitalist oligarchy, which is what We Are the 99% was about. Occupy was a movement that took place on the streets, but it was a protest about representation that began online and was facilitated online. It was a network protest. And when people ask you, why did Occupy end? I mean, there have been hundreds and hundreds of think pieces about why Occupy ended, and uh, all of them could be about two words long, which is, uh, well, maybe three, per four words. Massive global police repression. That's why Occupy ended. It's, it's really, really simple. There was a coordinated uh, attack on... Um, thanks. Uh, there was a coordinated uh, attempt to suppress that protest uh, by police forces across the world. And eventually it worked because these people were... Um, the, the idea of what they were doing is very, very new. But I believe that the, the spirit of that movement has not gone away. It's dispersed. And... Um, what interested me when I was looking at the coverage of the Cecily McMillan trial and when I was looking at the coverage of the Alfie Meadows trial, I was trying to find a picture of um, poor Alfie with his... Um, Alfie Meadows was, uh, was assaulted, allegedly, I'd say allegedly assaulted. He was allegedly assaulted by an alleged police, br police baton which allegedly split his skull right open and left him bleeding into the brain. Um, on the 10th of December uh, 2010 and was similarly uh, charged with violent disorder and uh, he could have been sent away for 10 years. There was uh, the pictures of the injuries to Alfie's head are actually, I thought, too upsetting to, uh, to show in a public forum like this. But looking at those, looking at those trials and reading the coverage and reading what, what a lot of people were saying on it, I noticed the similarity in the language being used there, the language of asking for it, the language of, well, you went out there, you put yourself, um, you, you put yourself up against the police, you said what you thought, and um, that, so that's going to happen to you. So you were asking for something like that to happen to you. And I noticed the similarity. The only other place that I see that language used routinely, particularly online, is when people are talking about rape and sexual violence. Um, so, um, this is also Berlin. Uh, there are lots and lots of pictures of the slut, works, slut walks on the internet, funnily enough, because uh, it was a massively media-savvy and fantastic protest. But this is uh, Berlin in 2011. Uh, the slut walks were a protest that actually, I think, significantly started at the same time as the Occupy movement. The, the New York slut walk was on the same day as the Brooklyn Bridge protest, and some people ran from one to the other. And those protests, in a very similar way, were about what it means to say yes and what it means to say no to having something done to you. And it was also a really fun chance to walk around in your underwear in the street and scream, and, uh, which is totally legit. I had a lot of fun. Um, but um, the idea that... Um, sorry, I'm going to wait for that to stop. Um, the idea that women and girls in particular are docile bodies, that all we can do in terms of existing in public space is protect ourselves as much as possible and wait for the bad stuff to happen and hope it doesn't happen to us, is what these slut walks were attempting to, uh, to, to, to stand against. People walked around, and some people walked around dressed in their underwear, some people walked around dressed in the clothes they were wearing when they were raped, saying, this is what I was wearing. Some people just held massive signs saying not asking for it and um, the idea that consent isn't something you just stand there and wait for somebody to take from you 
is a really important part of what is happening with feminism right now. And I don't believe that this kind of conversation in the kind of populist way that it happened would have been possible if it weren't for the enormous discussions that happened in the few weeks beforehand. The slut walk started in Toronto after a police officer told a group of college students that um, maybe they should just avoid dressing like sluts if they didn't want to be raped. And this is something that women have heard for, oh, now people are leaving, I see. <laughs> now, this is something that women have been told for many, many years. Police officers have been saying this to women and girls, and to men, but mainly to women and girls in the context of slut shaming for generations. But somehow, this particular police officer on this particular day became the target of all this resistance. And... Um, suddenly this movement went viral and there are still slut walks going on but more importantly there has been a massive change in how we talk about consent and how we talk about desire online um, and I believe that online is where most of the important discussions about gender and sexuality are happening. I mean, I spend most of my time sitting in front of Twitter in my pants looking at what people are shouting about on Twitter in terms of, uh, in terms of feminism and gender and what flame wars are going on today. And, uh, but I, I started off um, in the wacky world of feminist blogging in, uh, in about 2006, 2007. And back then, it was still considered quite out there to write you know, a big piece saying that date rape is rape. And we've really moved on from that now. It's been incredibly fast, the, uh, the change in, um, in how we talk about consent and desire. But when I saw these, these protests um, happening, and when I saw all the images of the big, this is not permission, um, uh, signs and, and, and body art. What I thought about is this. Um, does anybody, was anybody there on that day? British people or people, this is, oh, yay! Woo. Um, that's uh, the, um, that's March 2003. Um, the massive uh, anti-war demonstration. That's in London, uh, which I've, I've blurred that so you can't see the socialist worker sign on the, uh, on the not in my name pictures because the socialist worker are a bunch of rape denialists and they're uh, splitting into a thousand tiny bite-sized parts right now. I'm going to pretend that was for that. Um, but I remember, I was 16 and I remember going up to London, my first big protest, and just seeing this sea of no and this sea of, you know, I do not want this to happen. Lack of consent, not in my name. And I thought, and, and, if, and for anybody who was there in many of, many of the anti-war uh, anti protests in, from 2001 to 2003, will remember that as a hugely significant moment in the forming of the political sensibilities of a ge generation because um, people before that had sort of been laboring under the delusion post-1989 that democracy was functioning well and that generally the wishes of the people were being adhered to. And uh, what happened on that day uh, was that um, in, in London it was two million people, around the world millions and millions, the biggest global protest ever, and it made absolutely no difference. We still went to war, Britain and America still went to war, and, uh, the, fact, and the fact that the wishes of the people were clearly ignored um, and was uh, a really seminal moment. And um, I speak to politicians in the UK uh, right now, and they really don't understand why we're still talking about it. They don't understand why it still matters and what a huge snub that was, particularly for people who were just coming up at that time. And we really, we realized that just asking the government not to do something was not the way it was going to work. And in fact, we'd been lied to. And I remember uh, about eight years later, when uh, I was at, uh, at Millbank, when uh, the students in the UK were smashing up uh, the HQ of the Conservative government, uh, walking around with a, a recorder, uh, saying, why are you guys doing this? And, and them saying, well, we did the peaceful protest thing in 2003, and it didn't work. So what are we supposed to do? And... Um, I, the, the similarities between uh, what is happening in terms of a raising of consciousness about rape and sexual violence and what is happening across Europe and America and the world in terms of a raising of consciousness about what representative democracy can mean, the similarities are 
Suspicion of institutions, loss of trust in the justice system. That means that nobody really expects the police to do what we, um, certainly if we were nice white middle class kids who, were, who grew up being told that if you're lost, you can ask a police officer for directions. Um, the idea that the police and the courts work in your favour, that there is justice in the system and all you have to do is petition that system to work well, um, is rapidly disappearing. I'm seeing that, dis that disappear across the board, both in terms of um, the uh, uh, terms of the women's rights movement, in terms of the consent movement, and in terms of how people understand um, democratic protest, the right to protest. And instead, this has been replaced by a peer support network, which is not always the most effective thing in the world. The bonds, are, the bonds of the online network are loose, but it involves the most important thing is the sharing of stories, the sharing of individual stories about dissent and about people's real experiences um, under patriarchy, under capitalism, under a system of debt peonage, and uh, having a place to publish those stories and have them recognised. There's so much of the Occupy movement. Um, you remember it started with the Occupy 99% Tumblr, the We Are the 99% Tumblr, which was just people standing with placards saying, this is my life, this is what has happened to me. And similarly, the... Um, the uh, movement against rape culture all over the world, and I'm talking in India, in Egypt, where I visited last year to work with the women's movement out there um, and report on that. The, the whole thing has started with people being able to go online, write their story, and have it listened to. And of course, there are costs to that. People have been viciously attacked in online and in person. I you know, include many of my closest friends in that. Um, this is why um, this matters to me as a journalist, as well as a feminist and an activist and, um, and a socialist. Um, this, uh, I said that like I was ashamed of it. I was like, socialist? <laughs> I'm not. Uh, but uh, this matters to me as a Oh, <laughs> no, this matters to me as a journalist because to me, this is what media should be about. It should be about facilitating, facilitating people telling stories without the intervention of a state propaganda machine, official or unofficial. And the resistance within the mainstream media to this kind of storytelling has been enormous. I mean, I really could not have guessed the, um, the level of backlash there's been um, from the mainstream as well as from anonymous trolls on the internet, because we talk a lot about how, um, how women in particular, when they're talking about rape and violence online, are the targets of, um, are the targets of abuse and harassment by trolls. And that's true. Um, I have a, a lot of reason to, to, to believe that that's true, but it's also that some of the harassment and belittling and dismissal comes from a very, very mainstream place. And it's really important to remember that whenever we talk about the fight to make, the fight to make these things visible. Um, enthusiastic consent. Um, this, is why, this, this talk is the fault of two people, El Eleanor Seiter, Dymaxian, and uh, Kitty Stryker, who is a, uh, a sex activist in San Francisco who is working on a book about enthusiastic consent, which is a term, I can see a couple of people really grinning in the front few rows, which means I know where you come from on the internet. Um, <laughs> but uh, enthusiastic consent... Uh, is a term that's become popular in the last couple of years. And, and again, this is happening purely online. And I, I also see you know, people writing serious literary articles in, in the Dead Tree Press saying, where are all the feminist books? Well, so, well it's all online. Most of the important feminist and uh, you know, gender activist thinking uh, t happening right now is happening, um, happening online. And I say that as somebody with a book coming out because they made me. Um, Enthusiastic consent is the idea that consent isn't just not saying no. Consent isn't just submitting to something being done to you. And, um, you know, consent involves enthusiasm, mutuality. And uh, I, was, I was thinking about that, and I was thinking about, this is obviously um, one of the Occupy GAs. Um, I think this is in New York. Um, I was thinking about being part of student movements and part of anarchist movements and uh, being part of the uh, idea of, of, of direct democracy as it happens. I don't know if anybody has done that kind of direct democracy with the, the wiggly hands. 
I can't see. Yeah, just wiggle your hands if you have. Don't put your hands up. Yeah, yeah, good. Thank you. All right. Um, but anybody who has been involved in that knows that it, it, it's silly, but it's also really, really exciting to be part of because suddenly you feel like even on a very, very local, small level, you're part of something where your voice matters actively, where you don't just get to say yes or no to one set of bastards who might be a little bit less awful than the other set of bastards every five years or so. It can be about more than that. And, um, and so I think that it is really, really important to talk about enthusiastic consent as it might apply to representation as well as it might apply to, uh, to fun, sexy times. I also have a, uh, I just wanted to use this because I love the slow lorries. <laughs> Um, I w- yeah, I-, I was trying to find a- a- an appropriate YouTube-friendly thing to show, to illustrate enthusiastic consent, and it's this. Um, enthusiastic consent is about really, really liking, or at least not hating, what's being done to you on an everyday intimate level. And this is something, the idea of this is really, really threatening. It's threatening to patriarchy when you talk about um, rape and sexual consent. There are, can, there are political candidates and political donors in the UK who, um, there was a political donor in the UK who last week came out and said that a, wom- a married woman cannot be raped because uh, if she consents to something on her wedding day, she cannot say no. Uh, until the mid 90s in Britain, it was uh, legal for a husband to rape his wife. Um, these are not old, old ideas. This is something to which resistance is active and very vicious, uh, particularly online. Um, and uh, in th- I think we have to start thinking about applying those ideas on an intimate, everyday level to how we make decisions as part of a state, to how we make decisions as part of a community. And um, this is where it all becomes a little bit theoretical because... Um, I am still in discussion with people about how, much, how that might work. I'm still interested in hearing people's ideas about how that might work. I think it is very, very possible that we don't yet have the technology um, quite to make a system of consensus-based, um, enthusiastic consensus-based decision-making work on, more, on, a, on a more broad level. I've seen it done very, very well within small communities, anarchist communities, um, women's communities, but it tends to, we, we are still talking about how to make the technology work better. Um, but what we do know is that the system of representation we have in, um, certainly in Britain, um, uh, in America, uh, in various parts of Europe and the EU right now does not do what it says on the tin. It does not represent the wishes of people on the ground. Even, and, peop- and the fact that more and more people are, becoming, are coming to realise that because of this networked raising of consciousness is really, really threatening because nothing has really changed in terms of the in terms of the way the system functions. It's been working in this way for generations. What has changed is um, that people no longer quite believe that it does what we've been told that it does. People no longer believe that representative democracy represents. Um, And the the immediate consequences of this in Europe, um, what have I got? (laughs) Uh, The immediate consequences of this in Europe were the election that's coming up on the 22nd. Um, are that um, there has been a, in the post-Occupy era, there has been a massive rise in anti-political, far-right, libertarian and actively fascist movements across Europe. There's UKIP and the BMP in the UK, there's the Golden Dawn in Greece, Get Wilders, Party the Front National, and those parties are gaining a massive share of the vote in um, across Europe. It's very, very worrying indeed, so um, I don't want to be... Oh, Whilst I am really, really excited that this lack of faith in, um, in representation is happening and that and a change in the idea of what democracy does is happening, I think we have to be really, really clear that this is uh, about what is happening and understand that people are also very, very afraid. And uh, when people see, see uh, systems that they believed worked and that were magically working for many, many years, um, not doing what they promised, people become very afraid. And um, that has potentially um, terrifying consequences, especially for minorities, immigrants, um, and, uh, and the poor uh, across Europe right now. So um, uh, this is basically the conclusion of this talk. This is what networks do. The question is, what do we do next? 
Um, networks make different kinds of desire visible. I'm talking about not just sexual desire, not, not, uh, not just romantic desire, but also political desire. They allow us to talk about what we want in a much more active, intimate, everyday way. And that is incredibly threatening uh, to the current social order, but and, um, it, it lets people imagine um, how, um, how people might run their lives differently. But what, the question is what we do next and how we weaponize that visibility of desire. Um, and that is, uh, that's a phrase that came from the drunk eight evening of, um, of, of writing when I, I made this talk happen. Um, the, yeah, the, the big question is, how do we make this work in order to, um, to not have a descent into anti-politics, which is what I'm seeing right now? The question is, how do we square this with a voting system that is so abysmally broken that people have no faith in it? How do we make... Um, how do we use the network to create a society uh, in, of which uh, Emily Wilding Davison, um, among many, many others who have fought for democracy and freedom over the past few centuries, would be truly proud? And um, I don't know the answers to that yet. I just hang out on Twitter a lot. But I'd be really interested to see if uh, anybody out there has any answers. I think this needs to be the start of a conversation. And uh, I think we need to understand what desire and power is in a, uh, in a new way. And there's, um, there's more I wanted to talk about, uh, but we can get into that in the questions. I want to talk about Steubenville and uh, how people are resisting rape culture. But if people want to ask me about that, that would be great. Um, any questions people have... Um, that will be, you know, that's my Twitter and that's the title of my book, which is coming out in July 2014, early July. So by about mid-July, it'll probably be available on the Pirate Bay. So just watch for that. Okay, that's it. Thanks. <laughs> We have time for questions, yeah. If people have questions. Any questions? Or comments thrown fruit. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Uh, just a quick one. When people and friends that I respect and find intelligent make a rape joke, what should I do? Oh. <laughs> I, I think the, uh, the use of... Uh, I, I think sometimes uh, people are expected to take jokes in the way... People, people say to me, you know, can't you take a joke in the way that people... I think I hear that as, can't you take a punch? I think saying that it's not funny is really, really helpful. Well, actually, so there I have heard some funny rape jokes, but mainly not made by the kind of people who then say, well, can't you take a joke? Um, if you don't laugh, then it's not funny. Um, I think pointing out why things like, why joking about rape and joking about violence as if they don't matter um, is something that is uh, harmful and, and hurtful is effective, but uh, it depends what context you're in. O honestly, it depends if you're in somewhere where you can do that safely, where you can do that without inviting violence because we still live in that world. You know, I don't always talk back because sometimes I'm not in a situation where that's safe. That's, that's honest. So, yeah, you, you, it, it depends on your own, on your context and your personal situation. Have we got... Hey. Yep. <laughs> Hey, great talk, by the way. Um, so we need to approach political change the way we approach economic structure change because a political system is a part of an economic engine. And um, people within this industry are motivated for economic gain. Once you can make open, consentful politics economically viable, you will start to see um, the political powers that be embrace it more openly. For example, um, Sean Parker invented Napster, um, which was a revolutionary system because it broke the music industry. 
But now, musicians release most of their music for free and make money off of the people who want to pay for it and want to see them in person. So you have to make politics something that people want to use and want to be a part of. Um, I don't know how to do that, but I feel like if we approach it from making openness economically viable, we will have more uh, success approaching politicians, approaching a powers that be with these new ideas and these new systems. What's your take on that? Oh. I think talking about making systems easy is a really, really important thing. And I think that's, I think you're dead right that that's one thing that networks do, is that, and which is why I don't always get down on clicktivism. You know, signing a lot of petitions online uh, is easy, but it also makes people think about how they engage in the public sphere. I mean, as long as that's not where it stops, that's fine. I think. I, from the reading and talking I've done to people who are smarter than me and know more about this stuff, uh, I am pretty sure that the, syst that the, I, that the notion of uh, a system of liquid democracy and liquid, and, and liquid economic, um, e economic decision making, that, um, which would be both transparent and anonymous, which you need both of those things to, uh, for a... Um, for a functioning system of representation. We don't necessarily have that yet, but that doesn't mean that we can't have it ever. And I'm really hoping there are some people um, in this room, in this conference, who are working on that kind of idea. Um, but it's um, obfuscation is a tool of power. Um, it's a tool of economic um, economic oligarchy um, in particular, um, where people say, you can't understand what this market does, it's too complicated for you, um, just, you know, this happened because it happened, you know, it was an act of God, and we are encouraged, obfuscation is a, uh, a way of distracting attention from who wields power, uh, which is one of the ways, that, one of the reasons that making networks easier for people to access and use is important. Does, does that answer your question? I feel that, that this is more of a chat, which is great. Like, for all of politics. And the reason I, I wanted to ask you that is because you spoke a lot about making networks easier to use mm -hmm. and making networks available to everyone. I think that that's the right direction, but I think approaching it for mass adoption has to be economically viable because these old people with these old archetypes from 1850 are still alive and they still need to understand something because they do control a lot. Um, yeah, it's, yeah like, it is a very discussion-oriented statement. But yeah, yeah, and again, which is why um, top table speaking should be should should be destroyed and replaced with this in many many ways. I think this. I think more productive things can be done with like actually sitting and talking, and I'm happy to do that afterwards. Um, although I'm very very full of adrenaline right now, so I might have to have a sit down. But um, I think. Um, yeah, people are certainly building tools, or att at least attempting to build tools, um, which allow for processes of, processes, of, of processes of representation. What interests me in the ideas coming out of Silicon Valley um, are who is making the tools and, what, and who they are making the tools for. Um, I, I've also spent a long time um, in, uh, in mental health activism, uh, talking to people who do not, who use the same tools, who are incredibly empowered and, um, and connected for the first time by these networks and by using the internet, but they need the state as it's in its current form. They need the welfare system. They want to be able to have a say in that particular um, in, in that particular aspect of what the state does for them and in terms of collective good and uh, the ideas about representation and government, I mean, this, this is a whole other talk, um, coming out of Silicon Valley right now are mainly being driven by rich, white, male, millionaires who Sean do not... Parker, like, Sean, <laughs> um, Sean Parker is probably one of the most rebellious people I know. Like, everything he touches either turns to dust or turns to gold. Um, okay, I haven't met Sean Parker, and in my head I'm thinking Justin Timberlake. I absolutely admit that. And so, let's talk about... <laughs> 
I, I don't I don't know the guy, but like I I've, I've and I and I don't live in Silicon Valley. I've I've just visited and, and written about it, which is not the same. I know, but like it's I think there. I think rebellion means different things to different people, and the people who are building the tools will affect uh, will have priorities that affect those tools, and that can be changed in influence. Right, and, and I think we should talk about this after as well because this is really interesting. But I think somebody else wanted to ask a question. All right. Where's the question? Oh. Hi. Um, I wonder if, um, as a result of the derivative scandal, and so many people lost their homes, and so many people in the Occupy movement were instrumental in helping people get back their homes. Mm -hmm. I wonder if this larger discussion that includes Edward Snowden has been divisive for a lot of the people who were initially involved in Occupy. Um, can you explain why you might think that? I don't really have an explanation. I just want to know if they feel that Snowden maybe takes away from these everyday problems people are facing, or if they feel like it's a systemic problem. Okay. Um, yeah, that's a really, really important question, actually, and, and I think not necessarily one that um, uh, goes down well in this sort of forum, so it's very, very brave to ask. Um, I certainly, in various kinds of activism I, I am, you know, involved with and various people I meet particularly who are working within welfare, within housing, disability rights, um, workers' rights, uh, the, what is going on with Snowden, what's going on with those revelations does seem a bit tangential, actually. Yeah, that, that may not be right, but I think that is a feeling on the ground that people are looking at wall-to-wall -wall coverage um, by some outlets of this issue and, they, and it hasn't been properly explained why it matters to them, why security matters. But I do think, the idea, for me, I think um, our notion of what security is and in terms of economic and, um, and state security is really bound up with the idea of, uh, of what freedom is and what consent is because uh, the, the notion of what... Uh, and again, I didn't get to this in the talk, but I think there is again a parallel in that we are taught that instead of being free... Let's say, like, we're taught as women that instead of being free to wear what we want and do what we want and go where we want, we should just, you know, try and protect ourselves as much as possible and then trust that the bad things might not happen. And that's um, what we've been being told, what, and particularly what Americans have been being told for at least the last decades since 9-11 is that security is much more important than individual freedom. You should give up your rights to do things. You should give up your right to not be watched and uh, not be surveilled and controlled in order to have this, uh, this greater liberty, security. Um, and there is that mangled Benjamin Franklin quote, which nobody is uh, really sure if he actually said, um, about how he who, he who would um, sacrifice liberty for security deserves neither. And I think it's very pertinent whether or not Benjamin Franklin actually said it. Is that... Oh, thanks. Oh, I've got ten whole minutes left. I thought it was running over. Um, anybody else? Hi, Alex. Hi. Um, I know him from the internet. You're the only one. Um, so I liked your discussion a lot. Um, I think something that a lot of people remember and associate with Occupy was... Um, a desire after it had coalesced to um, kind of recuperate it and a, a desire for political retrenchment. Um, there was all that commentary in the press. Now that all these people have got together, they need goals. They need a positive thing that they want. Um, I'm thinking particularly of Bill Clinton, who I think in New York said to Occupy Wall Street, or maybe it was an article, I don't know, now that this has all this momentum, what we need is a set of policy goals for Congress to be able to vote on. <laughs> and a kind of you know, taking all of that dissent and turning it alchemically into a kind of approval for the state process. Um, I wonder, do you see any of that in feminism? Is there a kind of acceptable form of feminism that you ever see being promoted? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's um, definitely... Uh 
uh, a kind of, I think some people call it liberal feminism and um, uh, neoliberal feminism is what I prefer to call it. There's an idea of an acceptable face of, um, what, uh, of what feminism and women's rights can be and particularly over the past few years as uh, feminism has become much more of a hot button topic, much more click worthy and much more dangerous and scary to people. These figures like Sheryl Sandberg have uh, emerged um, who are saying really not very radical things at all um, in nice suits loudly. Um, and, uh, and that is a sort of stand-in for the kind of radicalism that people really want. I know almost nobody within the online sort of feminist activism community to whom the feminism of, uh, of, bo of the boardroom and uh, of the business community has any relevance whatsoever. Uh, but I think it's really, really important to understand who is driving that feminism, who benefits from that kind of activism uh, being uh, the most supported and uh, the most uh, useful. As uh, um, the, Nina, the feminist writer Nina Power, who is fantastic, you should all read her book, One Dimensional Woman. She's also another feminist who is very, um, very, very active uh, in anti-police violence in, um, uh, in, in uh, the right to protest. Um, but she, in her book, One Dimensional Woman, she talks about this kind of you know, liberal mainstream feminism. She talks about these people as decoys, like, these are decoy feminists, and I think that is applicable to, um, to not necessarily the Occupy movement, but in, in movements like that, people do come through who are the acceptable face of whatever it is, who are shiny, who wear a nice suit, who are articulate, who are often from better off backgrounds and more educated backgrounds than many of the people they purport to represent. Um, and it's, yeah, it's really important to understand that happening. Um, yeah. Combat liberalism, hashtag. Anybody else? I think we've got time for like one or two more. Hey, Laurie, how you doing? Hey. <laughs> hashtag ban bossy. Um, so my question for you is about Thomas Piketty's new book, Capital in the 21st Century, I think is what it's called. Mm -hmm. And given that that book basically underscores everything that the Occupy movement was saying about um, economic inequality. Is there anything, what is, what is Occupy's response to that? Um, or well, if, has I, there been like a response to that or are they going to respond to well, that? Well, it's definitely got a lot of likes on Facebook. <laughs> um, well, no, I, I'm actually, I'm only halfway through the Piketty book right okay. now. Um, but I think um, the idea that, um, I mean, the, for those who haven't read it and aren't, or, or aren't like, haven't read the summaries, um, the idea, P Thomas Piketty, a uh, French econ economist, has basically come out with a book that proves that capitalism without, in, and uh, certainly neoliberal capitalism in its current um, form without serious social democratic checks inevitably um, leads to oligarchy and leads to gross inequality. That's just something built into the system. It's a feature, not a bug. And that's basically, yeah, that's what the Occupy movement was saying from day one. And um, the fact that there is now um, more modern theory to back it up um, is, uh, I, I, it's not, it doesn't necessarily make me sad, but it makes me, um, there's that word saudad, um, it's a Portuguese word, saudad, um, I don't know how you say it. Um, is, which means um, uh, nostalgia for something that almost happened but then never really happened. I wish that there had um, been more understanding and acceptance of those, of the, I wish that Occupy had been given enough time, essentially. I really, really wish that they had had more time just to be there and talk because really um, it's, it was a massively important time politically, but really the big heyday only lasted two or three months. And, um, and I think it's really, really, um, and I'd be interested to see what happens next because um, a lot of people are predicting that um, there will be another movement of that type in the next year or few years. Nobody knows what it's going to look like, but um, I'm really hoping that um, that movement will be able to learn from the last and have time to stick around a little longer. Um, anyone? Hey there, uh, thanks so much for your talk. I'm really happy to see this uh, subject being talked about here. Um, I'm interested in uh, 
uh, the mental health institution. You mentioned you had done some work in it, and I didn't know that the new the DSN five came out. I'm unaware of this new one, but um, yeah, just the the new like. Uh, mental health label now, this oppositional defiance disorder. Oppositional like, defiance disorder, it's just, yeah. I mean, I, I've, like, looked into the, the DSM, so it doesn't surprise me that that exists, but it's still, like, yeah, what the fuck? And, like, looking back at the history of it, like, it's all, these labels of mental health are always connected with, uh, like, radical, uh, like, activism, like, uh, people in the Black Panther Party were labeled as schizophrenia, yeah. and even, like, slaves running away from their masters were, like, ha Crazy. there was a special label, like, their brains are wrong, and, like, I just, I know that, like, in 20 years or so, we'll look back, and, like, there'll be a huge critique on this label, but I'm just curious, like, uh, other work you've done in this, like, mental health activism stuff, so. Okay, Thanks. I could talk Sorry. about that for another hour, and okay. I have to get off stage in one minute. Yeah. Looks, maybe but, at the break um, or so. <laughs> yeah. Um, the use of uh, the medicalization of dissent and the pathologization of dissent has been um, something that's happened uh, throughout the history of the modern mental health system, through, throughout its entire history, and particularly in the last century when uh, people started to categorize and define what disorders were. And, but you saw this with Occupy, um, people, being, people being called crazy, people being called, and people being called mentally unwell. And, even though, and actually there were a lot of people who turned up at those Occupy camps because they were in desperate need of the kind of social and mental support that they weren't getting in the outside world, those camps were also functioned as, that they became like healthcare centers for a lot of people. Um, the, uh, you know, women being called crazy, hysterical, the, you know, 10, 100 years ago, just the idea that you didn't want a husband and that you would like to have some sex was a sectionable thing. You could get locked up and have parts of your brain removed because of it. All of the suffragettes were considered hysterical and considered, and, and many of them were sent to mental institutions and, and remained there. Um, I think um, for me, and for a lot of the people involved in Occupy, and again, this, was, um, this is a whole different talk, uh, what radical politics are for, um, and what they are for at their best is um, it is about mental resilience. It's about emotional, the emotional resilience that community and resistance brings. I think um, what is really, um, what is truly pathological and what is truly damaging to people's health and well-being uh, is uh, passively sitting by while all these terrible, terrible things go on and accepting the system as it is. To me, that's what is pathological. And there is definitely a war of definition going on right now. Um, and uh, my favorite thing about all of these movements is how people support each other in building this kind of new world. And, and I guess I'm through my minute. So thank you. Yeah.